second i'm gonna launch it on facebook as well which is gonna take like one minute Hello. Bonjour, everyone. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. It is a great pleasure and a great honor to welcome Eric Banks, Laure Murat, and Maggie Nelson for a conversation on Murat and Nelson's latest publication in France, Qui annule quoi, published by Seuil, and De la Liberté, Quatre Chants sur le Soin et la Contrainte, published by Edition du Sous-Sol, and translated by Violaine Wisman, a French novelist and translator whose work we love and champion here at our team. We would like to thank P.J. Mark, Geraldine Gislain, and Adrien Bosque for their help and support in organizing this event. And I'll just say a few words about why we've, we're so happy uh, to welcome this conversation. Like many of you, this time of social changes has filled us with hope and as in every revolution, we've also gone through moments of uncertainty and unease. And the reason we wanted to host this event is because reading your books, Qui Cancel Quoi and De La Liberté, has enabled us to see through the fog and the noise and to think about terms like freedom, cancel culture, and how these terms are used and why, and how we can still envision to practice our freedom here and now while welcoming and embracing progress. So this conversation will not be about solving social issues, but it is about reframing our present in ways that will allow us to collectively think, debate, and express also our disagreements. Laure Murat is a professor in the Department of France, of French and Francophone Studies at UCLA. She is specialized in cultural studies, history of psychiatry, and queer theory. Uh -oh. She is the author of La Maison du Dé, won Le Goncourt Prize of Biography, and the Critic, the Critic Circle Prize of the Académie Française. She is also the author of Passage de l'Odéon, L'Homme qui se prenait pour Napoléon, which won the Feminine Prize for Nonfiction, and which was translated into English as The Man Who Thought He Was Napoleon, and published by the University of Chicago Press. She's also the author of Relire Flaubert à la mode Piquet, Ceci n'est pas une ville, both published by Flammarion, and Une révolution sexuelle, Réflexion sur l'après Weinstein, published by Stock. Laure was awarded the Guggenheim Fellowship in 2012 and 2013 for her next book entitled Women as Symptoms or Madness at Work. Maggie Nelson is the author of several books of poetry and prose, including most recently the New York Times bestseller and national book Critic Circle Award winner, the Argonaut. In France, her work has been published by Les Editions du Sous-Sol and translated by Céline Leroy, except for On Freedom, which, as we said, have been, has been translated by Violaine Wisman. Uh, her, work include, uh, Les in, her work published in France include Les Argonauts, Bleuet, and Jeanne Un Meurtre. Maggie teaches at the University of Southern California and lives in Los Angeles. She has been the recipient of a Guggenheim Fellowship and NEA grants, an Arts Writers Fellowship from the Andy Warhol Foundation, and the MacArthur Genius Fellowship, among many others. We are extremely grateful to Eric Banks for accepting our invitation. Uh, just like Laure Murat, Eric is a longtime friend of Albertine, and it's always a great pleasure to welcome him. Eric Banks is the director of the New York Institute for the Humanities, a former senior editor at, of Art Forums. He's he was editor in chief of Book Forum from 2008 to 2000, from 2003 to 2000, till 2008. He served as president of the National Book Critics Circle from 2011 to 2013. And he was a two-term member of the NBCC Board of Directors. He was a judge of the Pulitzer Prize Committees in Fiction in 2017 and 2020, and was a chair of the Judge Committee in 2017. His writing has appeared in numerous publications, including the New York Times Book Review, the London Review of Books, among many others, 
and he has contributed essays to monographs on a number of artists. Additionally, he has edited numerous catalogues and collection of artists writing, and he is a consulting editor of the Robert Rauschenberg catalog, Raisonnée. Without further ado, I will turn the floor to our guest. Oh, and just one thing, um, after the conversation, we will open the floor to questions. Please write your question in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the chat, in the Zoom, and we will read them out loud. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you so much. And thank you for inviting me to moderate this conversation uh, between uh, Maggie and Laura. It's really a pleasure to, to, uh, to, to see you both. And, uh, and thank you. Uh, actually, we were looking at the titles uh, a, a few minutes ago. This is the UK edition of uh, Maggie's book, which I actually like now even more because I see how much it uh, visually rhymes with, with Laura's recent uh, publication. Uh, there's sort of a Rhapsody in Blue taking place. Um, so it's great to see you both here today. I thought just as a way to get started, um, we might talk about uh, just in order to draw some uh, points of contact between your work. Um, I'd like to ask you both sort of how you came to these respective projects. Uh, and I'll start with Maggie. Uh, Maggie, could you elaborate just a bit on the connections between uh, On Freedom and the Art of Cruelty, which you've spoken of previously? Um, uh, why did we end up with On Freedom for Songs of Care and Constraint rather than perhaps uh, The Art of Care? Uh, I'd be curious as to how you, you came to this project. And then I'll ask Laura to talk about a little bit of the way that she's come to be interested in cancel culture as a, as a uh, phenomenon. So shall we start? Yeah, great. Um, I'm thrilled to be here with you guys. Thank you so much for, for doing this. And I'm just glad to meet you both and or meet you again. Um, uh, yeah, so it's interesting. I mean, I think that uh, um, The Argonauts was like a book that kind of came in between The Art of Cruelty and On Freedom and then took up like a lot of time because it had a lot of readers. But I think in some ways, and I, I make this clear in the introduction to the um, to the new book that that you know that you know I'm sure that Laura does too and Eric you too but you know we have a lot of interests that kind of run on these different tracks and and a kind of scholarly interest way this book does kind of flow from certain lines from the art of cruelty now that when I started the art of cruelty project you know kind of for better or for worse I often tend to research or think in keywords you know like I get interested in something and and I was looking I was interested in cruelty I think because I speaking of things coming off of other things, I had just come off of writing two books about sexual violence and a murder in my family and spent a lot of time thinking about um, representations of violence um, uh, in a more intimate sphere and like my role in re-representing those acts of violence in literary text. Um, and so the art of cruelty was a kind of a more scholarly attempt to deal with the same issues I've been dealing with in those other books. Um, about what representations of brutality do or don't do and what's the kind of 20th century obsession with um, their role in an avant-garde um, milieu. So that was that book, but I think while I was writing it, um, there, there were kind of some surprise interlocutors that, that, that became important along the way. And one of them was um, John Cage and then another was Hannah Arendt. And I was interested in how instead of um, kind of posing compassion or care, as you say, Eric, as a like opposite of cruelty or brutality, that sometimes they would pose, and Cage in particular would pose, um, free, and, and rent too, but freedom of movement, like freedom to get away from a bad situation or flip a constraint so that the brutality didn't feel inevitable or all encompassing, you know? And I began to be really interested in like uh, what, what that, uh, what, what, what would happen if, if that were the dyad instead of kind of thinking that there was like um, freedom here and then obligation here, which is kind of the more standard like patriarchal or just kind of whatever longstanding idea that like the free subject is produced by being unencumbered and like women or slaves or whomever historically will do the work of being encumbered and then will produce the free subject to speak in the public square. So I was really interested in all that and it sent me off on a whole new reading set in and around freedom, which uh, I knew from the start because I'm not a political theorist like that I would have to read a lot about kind of right wing and left wing um, 
kind of reverse obsessions with the same concept, you know, and to understand for myself what these kind of funhouse mirror problems were between like a liberation discourse from civil rights and abolition movements and other things on the one hand to this kind of other, obviously we've seen in technicolor everywhere, um, this right wing discourse about freedom. And I think, I mean, what we're living through right now with the war in Ukraine and stuff is I think an interesting moment of kind of, um, I don't know, maybe it may be, maybe reminding us that those are not the only poles, you know, <laughs> but at any rate, um, I began, I began, I got very interested in it and I knew because I wasn't in politics or political theory per se, that I was mostly interested in <clears throat> getting at uh, more idiosyncratic or um, experiences of liberation and its possibilities or its impossibilities in realms that eventually became um, art, sex, drugs, and climate. Um, uh, which are politically adjacent, like they all have obviously political angles, but I was uh, kind of moving from James Baldwin's idea that you can't really assess the political state of a nation without attending in some ways to what he called it spiritual state. I might use different terminology, but mm -hmm. I was interested in marrying up some more affective spheres of conversation um, with anyway, so that's kind of a long short story of of how it played out. Yeah, you have the you have a, just a that wonderful quote from James Baldwin in the fire next time early on, which I want to return to in a minute. The, the <clears throat> I have met only a very few people, and most of these were not Americans who had any real desire to be free. Freedom is hard to bear, mm -hmm. and I love the way that you put all that pressure on the on just the concept of, of what we talk about when we talk about freedom so early on. But, I, but we'll, we'll, we'll perhaps come back to that in just a, in just, in just a bit. Um, it's uh, the, 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 the Baldwin-Hannah Arendt uh, exchange is also something that's so, that's so fascinating to be, to be reminded of as well. Um, uh, Laura, why don't I ask you uh, at the same, uh, just to, to, to answer in kind of in parallel, how did, how did you come to be interested in cancel culture as a concept? I mean, one of the things that, I think about regarding the kind of specter of cancel culture over the past <clears throat> half decade is that we we went through a very similar wave in the 1990s around the term politically correct or political correctness, which you know was emerged as an internecine term on the political left um, uh, to migrate as a kind of rallying cry that we can recognize today for various right wing forces. Um, and the process just captured a kind of way of caricaturing a whole swath of, of left social movements. Um, I mean, it was even such a thing that, that in the mid 90s, I remember a, a, a friend of mine in Germany wrote a book about Politische Korrekturen. Um, so we can, if we want to talk a little bit later about whether the, 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 there's something untranslatable about the term, at least with political correctness, that wasn't the case. Uh, but anyway, can you tell us just a little bit about what drew you into thinking about this as a specter and as a phenomenon? Of course, and your parallel is completely relevant. Of course, it is very, you know, similar to the, I mean, at least the reaction against political correctness is more or less the same uh, the, uh, as the, 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 the resistance, especially in France, against cancel culture. Um, First, I want to say that I'm very happy to be with you. I, I read Maggie's book, and I think it's a very dense and, and very interesting book in many regards, especially in debunking many ideas or, or prejudices that we have around uh, freedom, care, sex, etc. So I'm, I'm very happy to be here today. Um, to, to, to come back to uh, cancel culture, uh, I, I'm, I'm in at UCLA uh, for now 15 years, and I'm going back and forth, of course, uh, in, in France and in the US. And as time goes by, uh, uh, new French newspapers uh, started to ask me about the so-called cultural wars in the United States and you know the, this incredible resistance that there is in France against these kind of concepts like political correctness, or even Me Too. Me Too is directly linked to freedom. You remember perhaps the the, fam the famous uh, op-ed signed by Catherine Deneuve. It was about the freedom to bother. That's the French way of um, 
encompassing the, the you know, sexual freedom. Uh, we can com come back to that. So there is a, a, a very a reluctance in France against everything that can open, in my opinion, of course, the usual set, you know, the usual set of ideas that we have about cultural appropriation. Uh, I don't, I don't like, I, I should have started by saying that I don't like the word cancel culture. I don't think it's a concept. I think it's perhaps, perhaps a symptom of something, but it's mostly, and to begin with, a word that was crafted by, by right wing in, in the United States to denigrate um, the progressive ideas or, or theories uh, in place, especially on camp American campuses. So, but we can go back to, to this. So in, in order to, to reply to your um, question, actually it, it started with um, a lecture I, I did at the Duke and, and then in, in France at La Grasse, Le Banquet du Livre de La Grasse, which is a very famous uh, event uh, during the summer. And then finally, le, les éditions du Seuil asked me to, to publish it and I revised it the, for the final version. I'm, I make something a little bit more uh, articulate, I, I hope. So, but at, at the beginning, it was, it was the newspaper Le Monde who asked me uh, to, to think about cancel culture. And because the, the, the thing that, that was, uh, I think, a bit puzzling for me was this incredible violence in French news and medias against the, the, the cancel culture in general. And I thought the violence was a little bit suspicious. So I wanted to, to know a little bit more about it, but I'm not, by any means, I'm not a specialist of cancel culture, nor of, of a cultural wars between uh, the United States and France. But because I'm here and because I'm, I'm French and that I'm going to Paris on a regular basis, people ask me uh, you know, to think about th these problems, issues. Yeah, I found it. I, I, this is one of the things I was going to ask you about a little in, in just more detail. But, um, but I was thinking about the difference between um, the or the sense that it was that had, had taken hold. That it was a particularly American exercise. Um, and I mean, even to the extent that there were news items that I read some time ago about Macron's um, um, utilization and and um, of of the term and blaming it on American academics and particularly on on, on gender studies, which was a very curious um, a bit of news to I think to 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 reach our shores. I think that's one of the reasons the the, the so-called concept has been kept in English when when French people talk about cancel culture instead of saying you know culture de l'annulation or just you know, finding a, an equivalent. So it's just a way to say, be careful, that's the Yankee term, you know, that we have to, that we have to cancel, basically. Mm -hmm. And Me Too is also translated as Me Too, it's not Moisey or, yeah. Exactly. yeah. Um, well, that's, that's, a, that's, an, that's an interesting, interesting uh, 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 backdrop. Um, and, and and I was curious. It, it did make me think a little bit, also, Maggie, about the way that you you kind of be, you know also begin your book and in, in talking about the problem of talking about about freedom in this context. And I, I saw a conversation you had with Hari Kunzru some time back, um, where he was where you, the two of you were talking about this a little bit. And I, I wonder if you would elaborate um, about the difficulties of talk of really even discussing freedom in that in 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 an American context where it exists as a kind of I, I think a sort of assumed an abstract and absolute entity. Um, you offer that anecdote fairly early on for those who haven't read the book about um, your encounter with the campus bros and their setup of uh, who wants to talk about freedom, which I thought was very, was very, very interesting. If you want me to say more about that? I mean, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, you know, I've been thinking about freedom for five years. So when there's a booth on your campus that says, stop here, if you want to talk about freedom, I, I was kind of joking when I said, boy, do I, but you know, I also wasn't, I mean, I stopped, you know, because I'm also that professor, you know, <laughs> like, uh -huh. you know, things for a moment that maybe we'll get somewhere. But I think that, yeah, I mean, there's like, 
I mean, you know, you know, whether or not my book was going to even be called on freedom or even have freedom in the title was, you know, honestly, like an ongoing question, like it was called the freedom project, you know, on my desktop for a long time. Uh -huh. um, but, you know, we talked about just calling it four songs of Karen constraint or all kinds of things. But, you know, I, I kept it in because I do think that, um, I mean, maybe back to the Baldwin quote that you mentioned before about yeah. freedom being hard to bear. Um, forms of, you know, freedom and unfreedom come together. I mean, they give each other meaning and that can either be true in a historical sense, like in, in, in something huge, like, you know, transatlantic slavery or whatever, you know, like, I mean, or it can also, but it is also something that is true in a very uh, intimate sense. And I wanted to focus on um, in sexual exchange encounters and drugs and drug use and drug addiction um, and in climate life, like where we want to dr drive fast and feel free in cars, even though we know that as we have that feeling of freedom, we might be foreclosing freedoms in the future, you know, and, you know, just to continue with these few examples and, you know, in, in sex that we might want to feel a kind of the freedom of submission or unmastery, whereas we don't want the bad parts that come with being mastered, um, you know. Uh, uh, so, and then with, you know, with drugs, there's like all these feelings of, you know, I, I do think drugs, uh, certain drugs, um, and certainly for me, I don't use them anymore, but you know, are portals to different kinds of liberation, whether it's momentary or in a practice, but then they can also be, of course, kind of portals to a, a kind of enslavement that becomes insufferable. So in all these ways, I felt like the freedom unfreedom knot was really important to pay attention to and not sweep under the rug because it just doesn't, mm -hmm. it, it just doesn't, it doesn't make any sense. Um, so anyway, yeah, I think, um, I don't know where we were going with that, but I'll just say in terms of, um, you know, it's really uh, both in reading Laura's work and then in having this conversation now, you know, it's also I'm I, I'm I'm clearly not French and don't have any real um, uh, wide knowledge or deep knowledge of what's going on there. But, you know, certainly um, over the past five or six years, um, both with the, going to France with the Argonauts several times and then with this book now, um, I mean, this is true of any international context, but you know, you're you're mm -hmm. you're suddenly um, like catching the ball of whatever's going on there, <laughs> you know, and yeah. being like, okay, what is this ball? Like, what is its shape? And like, I didn't even know when I started with the Argonauts that um, you know, assisted reproduction or sperm donors or queer family or you know, gay marriage. Like, I didn't even know that all these things were not happening in France, you know, when I first started going there with that book and certainly not about um, certain things about non-binary gender. So I've gotten like a lot of, uh, I, so I had an education around that and then I've had an education in and around, um, you know, an interesting education in and around what you're describing, Laura, about um, like my book, I think in this country is seen as quite critical of certain, um, or not even critical, but like, uh, just like wanting to spend the time, as you say, I mean, you said debunking, I don't know if I'd say that, but like, you know, certainly just, um, you know, doing analytical labor of how we're using words like care, repair. Um, so some have interpreted that as being critical of um, aspects of progressive or leftist culture. Um, but my interviews and friends have definitely been more, I've found myself much more like a lot of the theory and things that are being maligned um, are foundational to my project. They're not what I'm critiquing in the project, you know, so it's been interesting to try and, um, you know, uh, shake that out and kind of make, make certain things clear. I don't know if this is coming across. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> I mean, that, that makes me think you, you wrote, <clears throat> And again, this is from, from from somewhat early in the book. Uh, um, you, 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 there's a sentence uh, where you're posing a series of rhetorical questions, but you said, "What effects has the insistence so intensely American that liberty leads to well-being, and that more liberty leads to more well-being, had on our understanding of both words?" Um, and you know, just putting it putting it back in an American context. And since you just raised this, I, I'm curious what your reaction has been to um, to 
uh, the sense that you might be actually um, uh, more critical of certain uh, rhetorics of care and practices of, particularly in the art world around uh, reparative gestures, then then you, you may not have necessarily intended. I'm just curious what your what your sense of that has been and what your reaction to that has 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 been uh, in the wake of the book's publication. If you don't mind my asking, oh, yeah, I don't know. No, it's fine. I think, you know, I've had a lot of good conversations like of this nature, you know, and of course, because of COVID, there hasn't been very much in person. Um, I mean, I feel like, uh, you know, perhaps this is very common amongst, you know, writers, but I, but I feel as though sometimes certain kind of hot button topics are so blindingly hot, you know, I'm mixing metaphors here, but blindingly bright or hot that they haven't, um, that there's like been fear, anxiety to um, like people think you're saying something you're not saying just because they're so blinded by the worry that you might be. And so I haven't felt except for, you know, I mean, in certain forms I have felt, but in other forms I have not felt maybe the, um, you know, the kind of like joining together to offer like, like, I guess what am I trying to say to believe that we that to move towards like a more just or even ethical uh world <laughs> whatever mm -hmm. that means that some of that may involve being critical about some of these ethical terms that we use or the wielding of ethics altogether including the presumption of ethical goodness on one side i mean pre presuming um that care doesn't have a long history that has coercive elements to it, presuming that things are not unequally distributed by race and gender. I mean, a whole host of things that that I wanted to talk about. And I think that that, and I, so I think, you know, but, but, but it's not, I can't really complain about it because the land of book reviewing or book reception isn't always known, especially in this, um, you know, very anxious environment. It's not always known for, um, uh, for engaging with all the nuances one hopes one has put forward and that, you know, that's fair enough. Yeah. Yeah. That's um, I, I think that kind of does, does somewhat, somewhat come from, from, you know, come with the territory. Yeah. Um, and, and, and I was thinking about that and the, the sort of emergence of this uh, rhetoric of care that you talk about and the fact that it, it, it you know, it really, the art world is really, I, I think even, even much more so than the book world or, or other culture industries, the, I think of that as the art world reached that place a little yeah. bit earlier than than some other some other spheres. Um, you know, I'm wondering if you would want to say you know something about that. Why you think that that's a, that came into this particular focus at this particular time? It really predates um, so many of the disruptions and and social movements that we've seen over the last even four years. I mean, I, I think of it as coming very much in the wake of. Mm -hmm around the time of, of, of Occupy and the, and the time that precarity becomes this kind of issue. Um, and I don't know if it, um, it's roots. I'm, I'm very curious if your, your thoughts about kind of the roots of this uh, emergence of this kind of new um, sense about the ethics of art making and, 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 and what we see, what people want to see, what they want out of art. I mean, I, I, there's a great quote that you had. I, I've often felt that art's not caring for me is precisely what gives me the space to care about it, mm -hmm. which I think is a really, a, a really lovely way and, and very concise way of putting it. Mm -hmm. But there's, mm -hmm. there's clearly a lot of, of uh, uh, contention around those terms. And mm -hmm. I'm curious how you would, how you would see that as uh, historically as coming into, into focus. It's yeah. definitely also the space of the time between the art of cruelty in the moment. So yes, definitely, and I think in some ways that part of that art chapter. I mean, I say so explicitly. It, it was like there's only ten years between them, but like a lot has a lot had happened in the ten years that I felt like I wanted to kind of revisit. And I think that you're right that one of the weird things about. Um, I mean, I don't anymore, but I, but you know, the bulk of my teaching life has been in an art context um, for many years and mostly traveling amongst artists um, I'd say maybe even you know as much as or more than writers in a certain way probably by choice and uh, and, and, and context um, but I think that you're right that I did notice um, like I remember when the art of cruelty was reviewed in the New York Times book review and they put a poster of Chris Burden um, <laughs> yeah. there's a fiction piece on the VW bug 
yeah. that case is old, right? Yeah, and that's literary like, people were like, oh my God, somebody crucified himself on the hood. I was like, yeah, 40 They years didn't tell ago. us about like, this. Oh my God, like, yeah, ago. I know. So I was really like, so I've noticed a lot this really like these different paces, you know, but I've also yeah. noticed a lot from being in both worlds and, and I'm not saying that there's no money in publishing. Okay, I'm not saying there's no money in literature, but you know, and I know, we all know that museum culture, the art world um, has money moving through it in a different way. And that it goes from everything from Sackler wings and pharmaceutical drugs to sacking of countries and raiding objects to um, the whole controversies over art spaces and their role in gentrifying neighborhoods. Um, uh, and then you have all of that put against like the precarity of most artists who are living and making art, which I think is important to point out. And I wanted to point out in my book because I think people who aren't in the art world or who don't teach artists for a living or something might have this faulty idea that like mm -hmm. they'll see a Jackson Pollock or they'll think of like the Duchamp or they'll think of this thing of like, oh, I just could piss on the floor and I'd make $5 million. Like most people I know make no money on their art. They operate at a loss. They work their whole lives you know, my students are in debt, you know, so there's this intense precarity of, you know, art makers, right, with the exception of, you know, a few. Um, anyway, so I think because of all of that, these things have driven the art world to a different reckoning much sooner in a much more intense fashion with obviously protests. And now I think the last thing I'll say, and I want to shut up so you guys can talk, but I do think that I, I do think that, um, I conceive of part of my role as a critic to not just let, like to make distinctions and not just like let there be kind of concept creep and bleed, you know? And I think one distinction I wanted to make in that chapter was that this whole discourse around kind of decolonizing the art world and of reckoning with rotten money and of all these kinds of things, um, I think that I'm not saying that they can be like, they're not cut off from the issue of being a maker, like of being an art maker, but they are distinct. You know, these institutional issues, I think, I mean, of course, they link up because the art that people make is what is being shown, right, or bought or sold or whatever. So, of course, they link. But I did want to draw some distinction in that chapter with these conversations about accountability and institutional accountability, mm -hmm. I do think play out differently. Um, when it comes to how art is made by artists. And I know that's something that maybe we're going to talk about later. And I did want to spend some time with that because I don't think it makes, I don't think art, I don't think art works upon the same logics. Like I don't think it can continue to be made with the, some of the ethical imperatives being, um, being imagined upon it. And so I think that that would, I, to me, that seemed worth spending time uh, to, like kind of pulling apart. Yeah, yeah. And so, yeah, I mean, so there was very, it's where there was very much of, 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 of seen as an intervention of sorts and, and not just an argument about what art, what possibilities art might offer um, to you in the role, you know, as a role of critic, but also an intervention about, you know, potentially about what it is that we expect from, from art making and from the people who make art and what at its, I don't know, most, um, when it, when it has that engagement, what, what kinds of possibilities it can offer us for thinking about different, different modes of freedom and the relationship to freedom and, 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 and other kind of, uh, rhetorics of care. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, in thinking about that, that, that same kind of place, I just want to bring Laura back into the conversation because I think we, you and I were going up for a little bit with, yeah, yeah. without Laura being brought in. So uh, I, I, when I was um, reading uh, the, 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 the pamphlet and I was reading it also in the in English translation, um, um, I was curious about how you see your position with regard to writing about, uh, about uh, who cancels whom or Kian um, do you, you, you write about it as, as, as from the standpoint of a historian, but 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 there's also you know a, 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 an intervention um, involved, and I wonder if you would say something you know say something about that. Yes, of course. Um, for a historian, talking about the present is very tricky. It's very risky because we know yeah. everybody knows, but the historian is very well informed that you know talking about the present is a, a tricky move. And but since again, I'm I'm a contributor to some newspapers, you know, I can do that as well. Uh, nevertheless, I, I chose a, a very specific topics with the, the tearing down of the statues because of course it was a, a, a connection to history, uh, basically. 
But I want to follow up with what Maggie was, was saying. I, I think the key word here is accountability. And, and um, often cancel culture is also called accountability culture. So when, and what I like in, in Maggie's book is, is that we, we see that's, that's why it's so important to, to analyze and, and do critical thinking about some concepts as freedom, care, et cetera, is that you have m many paradoxes and you have to, to think about it dialectically, I would say, and with some imagination. I think that's, you know, these are key words about what we're talking about. Um, and frankly, by, you know, studying this this topic, I mean, writing it on, on this topic, it was extremely interesting and, and revealing for me because I didn't know what I, I was about to find. In other words, paradoxes, more, you know, things that are more complicated than, you know, we are tearing down the statue because the statues in, in the public space because we are against colonization. It's basically that, but it's more complicated than that. And basically the, the response to that is also very interesting. When you're, again, like the French government, completely, you know, uh, reluctant to that and not willing to open the debate, I think that's very problematic, very problematic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that, I mean, I think one of the, one of the things that's interesting about, about the rhetoric of cancel culture is just just to return to some of the some of the things that you're saying, Laura, is that how much the language of harm has become just in, incredibly fungible. I mean, the the idea, uh, the the way that the, the the even the premises of what official cancel culture is supposed to consist of have, have been mobilized to you know against the 1619 project against critical race theory against the using the word gay in the classroom against uh assigning mouse um you know it's 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 a really flexible i mean once you start talking about potential uh shaming of 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 anyone in a developmental phase of, of his or her life then it's um it it can be a very easy um easy thing to apply no matter who the actors are exactly so it's it's an elastic you know concept it doesn't mean anything basically what is the what is the 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 common ground between, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, harassment on social media and tearing down a statue or rereading the story of the museums. For instance, you know, the, the, the colonial history of museums is problematic in Europe, I think, I, 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 I want to say. Um, so the, the cancel culture is an umbrella for so many things that it doesn't mean anything at the end. Uh, but again, I think the, the, the problem of accountability and perhaps of, of more coherence in the moves uh, artists are making is also interesting to analyze. And it, of course, it's a, an ethical reflection that we have to have. That's why in France it's called a moralizing uh, movement, which I think it's, it is not. And cancel culture can also apply to the, the book burnings that we are seeing now in the United States. When, when the Russian government, for instance, uh, cancel, because it's exactly what, what the government, the Russian government made, cancel memorial, which is an association of historians who are uh, working on the crime of the, the crimes of uh, Soviet Union, it is cancel culture too. And in my opinion, but that's, I mean, it's a complicated, perhaps, I mean, perhaps we don't know to go there, but it's the, also the problem of censorship, which is a problem of freedom and freedom of speech in, uh, among other things. So uh, censorship and self-censorship also. Mm -hmm. I think it's uh, the, the, the example Maggie uh, takes in her book on uh, Dakota 38, it's extremely interesting. Uh, it happens that uh, I'm talking but very briefly about uh, the statue of Lincoln, uh, which was teared down, I think it was in Portland, Oregon, uh, because of this event of the hanging of 
38 Dakotas in 1862, which is a, an example of military injustice and legal injustice. Um, and, and Maggie is talking about a work of art, of a, a, a sculpture that has been made uh, starting from this point. Can you, can you tell us, Maggie, about the Sam Duran's um, uh, sculpture? Yeah, I mean, Sam's sculpture was a, uh, it was putting together seven different uh, historical gallows. So that was, and that was one of them, what the Dakota 38 hanging was one of the other ones had to do with uh, where John Brown, the abolitionist was hung, where Saddam, Hain, Saddam Hussein was hung for war crimes um, at a Iraqi US facility where the Haymarket martyrs were hung. So it was, a, it was, a, it was taking um, documentary, uh, you know, blueprint evidence of those of all these different scaffolds and putting them together to make a sculpture that, you know, for, for Sam is about reviving the history of US state sanctioned um, murders. Um, by hanging between 18, I don't know what, 1859 and 2006 or whatnot. So, um, but because um, the scaffold uh, was, it had been uh, exhibited many places in Europe and other places before coming to the Walker where it was put, where it was erected on land um, that was uh, uh, Dakota land and was visible um, and it seemed like a kind of monument to this horrible hanging. It became an object of a great deal of protest and eventually um, Durant went into a negotiation with the elders of the Dakota tribe and agreed to have the work um, dismantled. Mm -hmm. um, but I think, I mean, it's a long complicated story, you know? Um, it's a complicated story, uh, but to me, I guess, um, it's a complicated story because there are many aspects to like the nature of the protest, the nature of its how the, it was resolved, the nature of the specificities of Native American sovereign claims upon land and land um, and, and the history of public sculptures on land and, and visibility, um, not entering a museum. So there's all these different things that make it really, um, there was about, there was issues about Durant's own, you know, it was important to him to kind of you know, that he went into that consultation to make a decision for himself and not have the walker necessarily um, uh, uh, make the decision for them to dismantle it. So there's a lot of complications. I think for me, I'll just say, and maybe this is the least interesting to anybody, but this kind of goes into something I was saying before, I think Eric in response to you is that like, um, uh, I think, I don't know, I don't want to make like a strong theory about this, but I think because talking about art is harder to talk about sometimes as art and easier to talk about as political object. Yeah. <laughs> and because we talk about politics and political objects and st strategic objects and all the time in our daily life, but we don't talk all the time in the discourse of how aesthetic experience affects us. I think that we um, sometimes are more comfortable in that conversation, even as it's very, uh, you know, raw and divisive and can be very combative and um, internecine and whatnot. But I think that uh, I, as I just mentioned before, I had, had, had spent, you know, probably a decade thinking about what what representations of, of, of historical or intimate brutalities in art um, like how unruly of an activity that, that is. And it's so unruly, in fact, that like when I wrote a book about my aunt's death, I, I was looking for a subtitle and I ended up titling it Jane colon a murder because I felt like it was so, I was re-murdering her again in my book. Yeah. Like, and, and that to me felt like this idea that like, oh, I'm caretaking her, I'm reviving her memory, kind of. I was also going over all the brutal details of her strangulation and shooting and being you know, left in a rural cemetery. And there was something really voyeuristic and horrifying and confusing. And as you say, Laura, like paradoxical about my own urges towards that event. Now, I think most makers are kind of aware. So in this case, to me, I was, you know, in part, I think uh, artistic intent and Durant's intent, if you know Durant and if you followed his career, his entire career is about social justice, right? So there was, you know, the intent here was, you know, was directly, you know, in opposition to how it was, the work was perceived. Oh, right? Nevertheless, nevertheless, he accepted to dismantle it. 
Yeah, I mean, but there's also complications there in terms of like, I think that for Durant, who has conceptual aspects to the project, um, going into a consultation with the elders and coming out with this decision and kind of like, um, was able to be incorporated into his practice. Like that's the story now of Scaffold and that is part of his, you know, in a, 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 of his art story and art career as like in that piece's story. I think for other artists who might not have felt, might not see the dismantling of like a, mm. uh, like wouldn't whose practice wasn't like amenable to that kind of thing might have felt differently. So there's different pieces there. Anyway, my whole point is that I think that, um, I think that part of the criticality around care is that even when people, like if you wanted somebody to have the ethical um, imperative to make a work that impugned white acts of state sanctioned or not state sanctioned violence against people of color or other people and brought it to public attention, that is, you might get a work that looked like scaffold. <laughs> mm -hmm. And still the work was deemed, you know, by many like evil. And so I just think that there's a very complicated, um, and, and that's something that as artists, we know, we know we don't control the work of our work in the world. And that is part of the risk of being an artist, you know? Yeah, it becomes almost unmentionable. I, there's, a, there's a strange thing around that piece that you, yeah. it, it's even hard really to talk about the piece in some yeah. without bringing in some kind of sense of embarrassment or shame to like in recounting it. I mean, there's something very specific about that piece. And I would say that's even the case in a different way with with uh, the, the you know other uh, piece yeah. of that moment with, yeah. with Dan Schutz's painting of, of Emmett Till. But yeah, I mean, I will um, just say that when I wrote about those two pieces, I wrote about them while they were happening because the book Yeah, was yeah, no, the time lag, yeah. Yeah, the time and then lag now is, everyone is, feels like they're untouchable and like kind of how yeah. dare you. And I guess, you know, I just feel like um, like I was even going to say, I've even said before for different um, interviews, I've been like, yeah, I'll talk about anything, but I don't want to talk about those pieces. I, I didn't say that to you guys in part because of the overlap about the Dakota 38, but also because um, I don't personally feel like that, and, but I feel like I have to have some trust in my interlocutors because otherwise it's, a, it's not a useful conversation. Well, and I think that's, I think it also goes very much to what you're, very much of what you're writing about. There's, that's, that's an essential tension between something like a representation and the fact that a, that an object of art and the experience, but it, these are not statements. They're not, these are not, you know, it's not, it's the different kind of speech, if it's speech at all, it's, it's, it, it's not the same thing. And that, and just the, the whole issue of sort of, you know, what it means to decontextualize um, an experience and a practice. Um, and so I think they're, I think they're, they're quite, you know, that's, that's, um, you know, that's, I think that they, they very that that piece, even if it's not something that one would necessarily want to spend a whole lot of time talking about, is yeah. you know it definitely fits into the to the larger question about what the purpose of experiencing art is and what we expect yeah. of it of that experience. And um, I just will say that when I wrote the Art of Cruelty, you know, I write about a lot of really difficult work in that book and. For some people I know, even, you know, people who've experienced, you know, radical forms of sexual abuse, so they'd be like, oh, I always loved that work by Mike Kelly about, you know, rape. I always felt like it was really cathartic or whatever. And then there are other people who'd be like, that work shouldn't even exist. It makes me feel so disgusting. How could anybody like it? And I, but I had so many conversations about that book and people's different response to the art in it that it just really was very clear to me <laughs> that <laughs> it might not have been, you know, these other later examples, um, I, are you know, maybe untouchable for different reasons, but I feel like I've been in the mix of beholding heterogeneous responses to work for a very long time. So um, that seems, and then as you know, Laura, like as a historian, you know, things don't stay the same. They don't have the same meaning over time either. So there's a very- so That's very um, important. Yeah. I think it's a key point. Yeah. Because many of these, the statues that were teared down in the United States were, uh, for instance, built in the 1920s at the, the height of the, the Jim Crow uh, rule. So, you know, it's also related to history of racism that is in the US and in France. You know, there's no, there is a difference. There's a historical differences, many of them. But I mean, so the, the one thing is the event or the, the people represented the second thing is when the statue has been built, which is, you know, very often 30, 40 years later, 
So we know exactly about the crimes these people have done. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not exactly a surprise, right? And now only there, there are protests against them, which I think it's, it's, it's healthy. I don't know what to do with that, but I think mm -hmm. it's healthy to uh, stand up against these kind of things. And the, of course, the big difference here is that, in, in, at least in my mind, these statues are official art. It's not art per se. It's not like when we talk about Sam Duran. It's, you know, it's just the l'art pompier, as we say, you know, it's very official and it's not, you know, uh, aesthetically interesting at all. So it's, so it is very different. That said, I don't think the, these examples have to be uh, destroyed in, in any way, because I think it's very important to not to deprive the oppressed uh, from the, the history of the oppression. There are also uh, traces of a certain uh, uh, racisme d'état, as we say, you know, so official, you know, racism of the mm -hmm. state. And I think that's also uh, belongs to history, mm -hmm. which has to be analyzed like this. I mean, historiographically in a way. Yeah. Well, it opens up different, it opens up different, um, context that were not that were not previously available i mean that's that's one of the one Absolutely. of the very interesting things and it also i mean you know it's it's there there's a history behind this i mean one of the first revolutionary acts during uh in colonial times was the pulling down of the statue of king george at uh exactly. <laughs> in downtown and exactly. new york and it was once a very famous painting that that, in, that hangs at the new york historical society by uh ortel of uh the and, and it was actually taken as this kind of uh great source of sustenance to those people who were who were um who were fighting on the side of abolition so in the 1850s so yeah, it's, it's an interesting yeah it's a very that's, also, that's very interesting because you know people think that cancel culture was invented two years ago no i mean it this is called vandalism so you know it's it, very long time ago what did the revolutionaries in France, the first thing they do, they tear down all the statues of the kings, of course, in the whole kingdom, you know? So it's a very ancient practice. I was just uh, about to add something, perhaps it's not directly related, but still Maggie and I are professors and we have experience, experiences on campuses about this, paradoxes. And I think it's always important if we want to think critically to make a difference between what we call the safe space that a campus has to be and the famous comfort zone. And I think what we are talking about, it's not a comfort zone. Art is not a comfort zone. It's a zone, I don't know, of discomfort, but at least of, you know, some um, provocation of, of something that triggers, you know, something that you didn't think about before. So mm -hmm. I, I, I don't know, Maggie, if you want to say something about that, because we are, con as professors, we are confronted every day to situations that, you know, put together all what we are talking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I always feel like I just want to, which I'll do right now, I knock on wood, because I feel like when I talk about when I, when people in France or other places like kind of want to know what are my horror stories about being a professor, you know I mean? I feel like so far am I knocking on wood? Is it like the kind of conversation we're having right now? Like this is what we do, you know? Like it's not, um, yes, things have changed somewhat, but you know, I was laughing before when you were talking, Eric, because like, you know, I went to Wesleyan as did someone else we know, like um, <laughs> in, in the nineties, you know, which was later spoofed by a friend of ours in a movie called PCU. PC. You know? yeah, PCU. And, and, you know, I, it, it's not, um, yeah, like none of that feels um, new or different. And I feel like maybe it's from that experience back then that I just, um, you know, haven't yet. I, I mean, I do know, obviously, new tenors, new perils, new threats, new, um, new, new problems, namely the one thing we haven't talked about probably happily for us all, which is the invention of social media, which did not exist mm -hmm. in the PCU era in which, you know, I think, you know, Laura, when you make that definition um, about, you know, 
publicizing words or actions of specific individuals or institutions uh, and renouncing one support of them on social media. You know, that latter clause is not the one that we had then. But um, I do think that despite all those new developments and the new, um, you know, maybe codes of conduct or different things that that, that maybe has required, um, I have not yet found I mean, and it's also by great grace of where I've taught and of my communities, but I have not um, found a certain kind of squelching of discourse to be part of my pedagogical life. You know? Well, that's actually, that's, that's, um, that's interesting. That's very interesting to hear. Um, you know, I, I think it's probably, uh, since we're right at three o'clock, I'm not sure if there are questions um, and I'll, I'll, I'll ask, um, our interlocutor, there, whether there yes. are. So yes. There's two questions, but it, it, I think they will be uh, um, quickly answered by, by law. But so you can feel free to go on for at least five, we have at least five more minutes. Yeah. Well, I was just going to note that, I mean, um, it's, it, it comes out a little bit, I think, in what, what you've just, just said, Maggie. I, I, I'm really touched by the, the sort of optimism is not exactly the right word but there is a there is a kind of optimistic tone at the end of your book and your afterward and um you know i mean especially considering what we've what we've we've all experienced over the last couple of years with the pandemic um and what fresh horrors we face today um um you know i've i've found that a very and and particularly given your last chapter on on this brand new uh, <laughs> question of freedom and, and, and constraint um, uh, around uh, climate change. You know, I found, I found it interesting that you ended on such a, such a, a somewhat optimistic note. Um, and I just wanted to ask you about that, which I found really, really wonderful. Um, yeah, it's funny, I did an event, my very first in-person event in LA over the weekend and someone's last question for me was like about optimism and they said, so you think things are, I said, I'm an optimist. And they said, so you think that things are gonna get better? And I said, no, <laughs> I said, but I'm still an optimist. And I mean, I don't uh -huh. quite know how to square those two things, you know, but also uh -huh. like, I mean, you're a historian, Laura, maybe you can speak to this, but like, you know, better for when? Like for the next 20, 30 years, I mean, I think, I mean, as we're seeing right now with, you know, the war and developments, like, I mean, you, you have these, then you look back and you say, oh, what we just lived through was X, you know, like, or whatever, but they don't, you know, you know, you know, if we're all so lucky history and time and perhaps human, you know, life will continue and there, and, and I don't, the idea of better, like once and for all better is not like a compelling Mm -hmm. um, idea to me but optimism that like it's worth it I feel I mean I'm lucky enough to feel from the position I'm in right now but I but that's my optimism you know I guess yeah I don't know Laura what do you think uh, about optimism I don't know like yeah I mean it's a silly it's like I mean a lot of this I think is just temperament which has a million causes and roots that can't be yeah I, I mean, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm going to say a, a, a stupid thing, but I, I'm, I, I trust the young people. Well, that's a good, that's a, that's a, that's a good way to go to the Q and A. Yes. So we, we had a question by Madeleine for Laure, who say, how do we get the French government or politician to engage with this walk um, in between the coma ideas? How have they turned the work movement into something more shameful and negative? Uh, they uh, understood as the French government and the politician. I mean, it's not only French government and politician, it's also the intellectuals and-, and Yeah. Well, I'm going to give a short response because otherwise I'm going to talk for an hour. Um, I think it's really related to French universalism and secularism uh, l'universalisme républicain laïc, uh, which turned now into religion, which is, I think, extremely concerning. Um, and there would be in France one way to be universalist, which I think it's not true. And especially because French universalism is based on the social contract at, I mean, for, for France, but also for the United States, for the, you know, the, the Enlightenment. Uh, 
Um, and at a period where slavery was, you know, common to France and the United States, and, and at the time where women were not accepted, was not where the women were not citizens. That's it. So we we cannot continue to think about universalism, claiming for the Enlightenment. It, that's it, it's just for me impossible. And I think that's the at the the core of the the issue. Uh, the French government is extremely rigid on these questions. Jean-Michel Blanquer, the Minister of Edu Education, has a laboratoire républicain, and he's specifically anti-woke. Each time he can say something uh, against woke, uh, woke culture, cancel culture, he does. And I think if Macron is reelected, um, which is you know, probable, um, well, it, it will stay the same. So my voice is very um, um, minoritaire in France. I mean, Usually people ask me because they know I, I will think differently than, than they do. Um, we have another question by Alice Dondigné, which is for both Suyor and um, Maggie. Uh, could you tell us about the reception of both of your books, I guess, in, 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 the, in your respective country? Maggie, do you want to? Maggie is very popular in France, by the way. Who knew? Big in France. Yes, that has to be said. He's popular everywhere. <laughs> I don't know about that. Um, uh, uh, yeah, I don't know. You know, I mean, reception is, uh, you know, I've, uh, uh, I don't know. I, you know, I, I've, I've learned by now that kind of, as Judith Butler has very sagely said to like try and live by the side of your name, you know, a little bit. So like, there's a kind of detachment. Um, uh, so I really tried to, you know, I've, 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 I've had some, I've had, I mean, I've had just some great conversations, you know, some really great conversations. I would just say has been, you know, the thing that, um, that I'm most pleased with, you know. I mean, I think that these issues are, they're not, as you say, about being rife with paradoxes. They're not solvable. They're not. Um, they're, yeah, it's an on, it's an ongoing debate. That's yeah, it. and I've had the good luck of having this book come out in a lot of countries at the same time. So I've spent a lot of time talking to people in the UK or in Germany or in France or in the Netherlands and in Israel. Like really different, really different conversations about liber liberatory discourse right now and um, mm -hmm. and about and about the status of um, you know gender issues sexual freedoms the uh, attitudes towards climate policy i mean just so many things so all of that has been really educational and and really um yeah just you know really terrific i feel lucky and uh for the for the for my little booklet um i i've been i've been lucky because i was you know invited on um radio stations i have article in the press but um, I had uh, sometime um, hard time on the radio specifically um, because I'm I'm constantly attacked. So um, well, I I don't care. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I I go to the battleground, but you know it's it's um, it's complicated. But but because the book is very thin and it's it's not expensive, it's you know it's it sells. Uh, quite well and and it has been reprinted twice now i think so it, it's also interesting to say broadly than my personal case that it's a new um, series at, at les editions du seuil which called libel which is a pamphlet can you say libel in english i don't know it's like pamphlet basically no it's yeah yeah uh, and and the whole collection you have thomas yeah. piketty you have you have you know many people who are now giving text for this very young series. It started in January, so you know, and you have now I don't know five or six titles, uh, and there is clearly a demand for that, which I think is a good sign. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it reminds me of a series that uh, University of Chicago Press did a few years ago called uh, Prickly Paradigm that was quite mm -hmm. good, 
And you had people like David Grabner writing for writing short, you know, relatively short. I mean, it was a range of people from Thomas Frank to um, the, to Grabner to Marshall Solins, a whole you know interesting group of people that published these rel relatively short, uh, you know, pamphlet size um, interventions. So. Well, good. Um, this your your what you said, uh, Maggie, uh, when you started to answer the question, reminded me of something I had just read in um, one of these little speaking of pamphlets, uh, uh, one of Adam Phillips' <laughs> recent publications, and it's he has such a great eye for the right for the exact perfect quote. Um, mm -hmm. And there's one, and he and he also has a great love for Emerson, um, but he has such such a nice one that said, "Except this is from Mark uh, uh, Kishlansky, the um, Harvard." Uh, historian from a few years ago, the quote that said, except for the fact that there was no solution, the problem was simple. And I sort of <laughs> thought about that quote uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. as you began to yeah. talk about the reception of the book. Well, it's funny. I just, you know, I, you know, Adam Phillips, I mean, it's, uh, he has a quote that I utilize in On Freedom, but where he says, you know, what can we do? What else can we do with unacceptable people or things um, besides punish them, you know? And I yeah. think that that has, it's one of the ongoing, again, no solution per se, yeah. but it's one of the ongoing questions, like of the many kind of like five ongoing questions that I really rotated around that, that was one of them, you know? Yeah, yeah. But a little question about what it means to change and what it means to want to change and that how yeah. we think about what it is when we when we think we've changed, I think it's very close to, to a lot of the questions you raise in, in, in the book when you're thinking about- And, and they're also related to like, you know, what Laura you're talking about is like accountability culture and accountability is a wonderful word. Um, the critique I think people have is that it, um, you know, if, if someone, if one person's not participating in that accountability, then it can, then it can look like punishment, you know? So the question is like, what kind of, um, which is not always, you know, I'm not saying that there's, it's never uh, the wrong thing, but if you put that with that Adam Phillips question, it does, put um it just asks us as you said earlier to like to have imagination you know <laughs> have mm -hmm. imagination about accountability without it without punishment like what would that what would that be and i think that that's for me where like uh, the the activism and the rhetoric developed by prison abolition is so um you know and psychoanalysis ironically together is actually so useful because neither is interested in a recourse to punishment as a form of accountability, you know? Yeah, 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 yeah absolutely. Very, very good point. Yes, you're right. Mm -hmm. I think we also suffer from, you know, a, a very polarized de debate. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. uh, when you say accountability, it's always that you have, you know, the good and the villain. So, and it's, and it's very irritating mm -hmm. for sure. Well, I want to thank you both. This was a, very, a most interesting conversation and uh, I really uh, appreciate um, being able to be part of it. And thank you both for joining us this afternoon. Um, and I wish thank we you, could Albertine. Keep it going for... on some patio somewhere with all of our participants here and keep talking. But... That will be, we'll, we'll do that at some point once we're post Zoom. <laughs> Let's be optimistic, right? <laughs> Yeah. That would be wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, Laure. Thank you, Maggie. It was a wonderful conversation. Thank you, everyone, for listening and joining us. We will publish the conversation soon on Albertine website, so you'll be able to share it with, uh, with others or to listen again to it. And please do read Qui cancel quoi et de la liberté. These are really uh, excellent book about, um, about our our complicated present. <laughs> well, thank you, thank you so much. And uh, I hope we'll have a pleasure to, to, to pursue this conversation with uh, all the, tr the, the three of you uh, in, our, in our walls, between on our comfortable seats and uh, between our books. Uh, à très bientôt. Merci. Bonne journée. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Bye, you guys. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thank you.